Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a, a conference about evidence. Uh, but I'll be talking about the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, there's only got one done there. Uh, it's got an awful lot of opinions. So, in a sense, this is the antidote to the evidence that's going to come next. Yeah, this, this, this is more, more, more polemic than science. Uh, but I'll just run, run through what, what I'm going to talk about. If I can find the right button to press, which I always struggle with. Here we go. First of all, I want to talk about inequality. Because, <coughs> in my view, uh, dependence is much more to do with poverty than it is to do with drug use. And I think we need to focus in on what issues we're talking about. We're actually going to understand the context in which things are happening. <coughs> The next thing I want to talk about is the value of threat. Uh, we actually get further, in my view, in delivering services to marginalised populations that the demand set. If we actually rely on the self-interest of the powerful and the comfortable, rather than on their conscience or morality. And I'll try and explain why that is so. I'll then look at some uh, vignettes from the history of the last 20 or 30 years that I think illustrates both those points. I'll then do a quick run through where I think we are today. And then finally, uh, I'll leave, leave you with a, with a thought, a uh, thought, thought for this morning. So, here we go. Inequality. There are three different models of understanding of drug dependence, drug addiction, uh, whatever language that you want to use. The dominant cultural narrative, uh, and you see this played out in the soaps and in films uh, and in novels, as well as in the, the, the mainstream news of the Daily Mail and, the, and, and most politicians, is that drug dependence is a consequence of drug use. And that ordinary people who use drugs will find that their drug use spirals out of control, uh, causing mayhem in otherwise perfectly satisfactory lives. And therefore, everybody is at risk, <coughs> and at equal risk, of suffering from dependence. And it's characterised particularly by people on the right as a random byproduct of excess. It all went wrong in the 60s, uh, when people actually began to uh, move away from culture that was based on, on restraint, uh, respect, self-discipline, towards a hedonistic, uh, uh, thrill-seeking lifestyle, which drugs is seen as being a part of. And drug dependence is seen as flowing out of people seeking pleasure and putting their pleasure before their social responsibility. That then characterises all drug use as risking addiction. And it explains why some people become addicted and others don't, by reference to their individual pathology. It's about them. It's about what's happened to them as children, or about <coughs> their mental state, or about their moral weakness. And the next thing this, this approach does is it really emphasises the power of the drug. The focus is on the substance, not on the person using the substance or the context in which they're using it. And all of this is rooted in a middle class view of the world. People who do have life choices. It, it, I never thought I'd say this, but uh, Theresa May was talking about this yesterday. <laughs> people in government, people in the media who don't realise what life is like if you're not in their guilty bubble. So there's a tendency to assume that the few people who become addicted at Oxford, who would otherwise got a first in PPE, they are actually the model for the, for, you know, for the 250,000 people who are addicted to heroin and crack. And they, trans and they have the cultural and political power to transpose that understanding onto policy and our cultural take on the whole issue. So, you would think, would you not, the, that's fine, because the Daily Mail might think that, the Guardian's going to think other things, and that will put everything right. Well, the Guardian basically, I think, actually takes the same view. Because the Guardian's every bit as 
as, as the mayor of the Telegraph. And the Guardian's view is to focus on the war arms officers failed. But how many times uh, have heard people suddenly go, oh, I wake up this morning with a new idea. The war on drugs has failed. No one said that before. Uh, and they see the problems associated with drug use, which BDP has been grappling with for 30 years, as being exclusively a consequence of <coughs> prohibition. And if only we could get rid of prohibition, everything would be wonderful. <coughs> And in order to do that, one of the things they do is they spend an awful lot of time talking about Mexico and not a lot of time talking about Middlesbrough. <laughs> so, that, for example, the sort of inconvenient truth that they ignore is that even cannabis, a much less harmful substance than most others, even cannabis, 75% of the tonnage of cannabis consumed in this country is consumed by 10% of cannabis users. 90% of cannabis users only consume 25% of the product. Now what that tells you is that 90% of people use intermittently at the weekend and not for very long. And their cannabis use slots into the rest of their life. And they are able to deal with their cannabis use and make it a pleasurable part of their life, just as I like to think I do with alcohol. That other people might think differently. Uh, now, <coughs> What characterises the 10 the 10% aren't a subset of the 100%. The 10% are a different group of people than the 100%. And, and similarly, it's exactly the same with other drugs, which is why it's not sensible to focus on the drug. We need to focus on the person using the drug and the context in which they're using it. So the dominant academic narrative doesn't actually go with either of them. Uh, as well as one number, there's also one spelling mistake, and this is it. Uh, so the, the key thing that drives this, like most other health issues, in our, our class divided, class and regional, we now have to say, divided society, which we've all of a sudden begun to notice after the last days, uh, it, it's social determinants that lie behind all of this. Most use, as I said before, is non-problematic. Most people will use intermittently or for a short period in their life, and they will move on. Even if they use the most dangerous drugs, even if they use heroin, most people will use heroin for a short time, realise where they're going, they'll have enough about them, yet social capital in the jargon, they'll say, hang on a minute, I don't like this, and they'll knock it on the head. If they can't do that, they'll have people around them who will help them do that. And they'll also have a real prospect of a job and a house and a career and a decent stake in society that will make it sensible for them to knock it on the head. But what about the other people? What about the people who don't have those resources, either innately or on tap to help them out? What do we know? I mean, you know if, 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 if drug, drug addiction was a random consequence of drug use, we've got three million people who used, who, who used drugs in the last year in this country. If it was a random consequence of drug use, then there'd be as many drug users living in Notting Hill, yeah, next door to David Cameron, as there are li living on estates uh, and, and, and inner city areas like, like, like St. Paul's in Bristol. You would be as likely to be addicted to heroin if you were, uh, if you went to Westminster School or, or to uh, or to Eton, as if you'd actually, or, or, you, or you were brought up by a nanny, as if you were brought up by uh, foster, foster carers that, that, that were found for you by Bristol Children's Services. We know that's not the case. We know people who have problems with their drug use are overwhelmingly working class men who have been in the looked after system as children. The education system has let them down. They've got mental health problems. They've been in and out of prison. And they also suffer with significant other disadvantages that they have. They are the people who, who when they start into addiction, can't get themselves back out again. They are the people who need treatment. And it also means they are the people who are least likely to be able to recover. Because those same attributes that make it less likely that your, that your use will become dependent 
those same attributes are lacking when it comes to actually succeeding, particularly succeeding in the very narrow sense that some people in the current government would like us to see success, which is exclusively completing treatment successfully with zero drug use and, and, and never coming back. Now, that, now, if you can do that, that's great. But it's not the, as, as we said, it's not the only thing we're trying to do. We're trying to keep people alive. We're trying to get them to a place where, where they can have a stake in society. We're trying to stop the collateral damage around, around bloodborne viruses, around crime, around lack of employment, the consequences for their children. There's an awful lot of things we can do, an awful lot of good things that are done by D BDP and other organisations that stop short of being drug free for the rest of your life. And the people who are, who, are, who are most challenged to make that journey are the people who are most likely to have that, have that problem. And they are the most marginalised people living in our most, margin, our most deprived communities. And we're seeing that ever more now as we see levels of drug use and drug dependence in London on a very clear downward trajectory. And levels of use Funnily enough, in all the places that voted to leave the EU, uh, for much the same reasons, I would say, the, the Burnley's and the Middlesbrough's and the Sunderland's, they're the places where heroin addiction is not going down. Uh, and, and even in those places, it's the people, it's the subsets of the population in the poorest communities and the people who struggle most who these burdens are, are, are placed on. So that's the if you like, that's the, uh, that's the, the theoretical <coughs> understanding that underpins uh, a, a, a lot of what I'm going to say now. Because everything I'm going to say from here on in is, is, is built on the assumption that the people we're working with are people that the system doesn't rate. People who, are, who, who are, 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 don't, mar don't just marginalise themselves, they're marginalised by everybody else. So we've got a, a situation where we want to deploy resources to benefit invisible people who live in invisible places where there's no media interest and therefore no political traction. And that means there's no money and that then means there's no services. <coughs> and that is the conundrum that I've been trying to solve all my work in life. How do you get the people who've got the money to spend it on the people who need it when they're not seen as being deserving? And there's a model uh, developed, unfortunate language, on, on a number of fronts. A uh, model developed by, by an American, uh, American sociologist, Stephen Spritzer, in the 70s, that divided the poor into two groups, which he called social junk and social dynamite. And social junk is used to describe people who the system can quite happily cast on one side and forget about it. Social dynamite are people who, if you cast them on one side, they'll go off pop. And it will rebound on you. And my argument essentially is if we're going to get the powerful and the comfortable to be prepared to invest in the invisible people in invisible places. We can either rely on their sense of morality or we can frighten them. And my experience over the last 20 or 30 years is fear is a much better way to unlock scarce resources than appealing to people's better instincts. Now, it's easy, I think, to say that that, 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 that then leaves you in a, in, a, in a problematic position, I think, really. Because you're then saying that you, you need to add to the stigma. And this is the real, this is part of the trade-off. If you're going to say, if you don't invest in these people, X, Y, and Z, nasty things will happen, then you're actually adding to their marginalisation. And I think that's an entirely legitimate, legitimate challenge. But if you don't, if you don't actually say we should invest in this for hard-headed practical reasons that will benefit the rest of the community, then I think you wind up, you wind up with no investment at all. 
And I think we see some of that the, 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 uh, being played out in the, in the States at the moment. In, in the, the, the last heroin epidemic in, in, in America in the 70s was concentrated amongst poor black people in urban areas, and the response was to lock people up. The current opiate epidemic in the States is amongst suburban white people. So it's seen as a health crisis. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, that, that, that is not insignificant, I think. Portugal, Portugal's always paraded as, as their wonder, wonderfully liberal dissuasion yeah, panels. Uh, I recently listened to the, to, to, to the head, of, head of drug treatment in Portugal, and he said something that was fascinating. One of the reasons that happened was that the Portuguese heroin epidemic was rather later than ours. And unlike most of the rest of Western Europe, was, at that time, it's not now, was less concentrated amongst marginalised populations than elsewhere. It was linked to the collapse of the Salazar regime and the cultural changes that happened in Portugal at that time. And there were a significant number of middle class heroin users. Interestingly, the solution that was found fitted that population. He now says, in his view, that if, uh, if, if Portugal was faced with the same issue now, they wouldn't go down the same route because there wouldn't be the same political incentive to adopt uh, that, sort of, that, that sort of response. So, in my view, although there's downsides to it, my experience is that if you don't actually emphasise what's in it for the rest of society, then the invisible people in the invisible places will get very little. And I'll try to it, it, illustrate that with, with, with brief examples from, from history. We've already heard about the harm reduction story, uh, about the recognition from the Thatcher government, Norman Fowler, a, a health secretary to the fore, that HIV was, was, was a bigger risk than drug addiction, and therefore we needed to make uh, make needle exchange and other services <coughs> available. Uh, being around Whitehall at that time, not actually working in Whitehall, but being around it, there was no there was no sense of providing services to people who needed it. Drug users were not seen as people deserving of the service. They were seen as a route of transmission to the, if you use the language at the time, the mainstream population. So there was concern that AIDS, again to use the language at the time, would move from being within the, uh, the gay population to being within the wider heterosexual population. Injecting drug users was seen as a route of transmission for that, therefore provide services for injecting drug users. <coughs> there was very little discussion about any moral obligation to provide services for people who were experiencing major problems in their lives. It was viewed exclusively in those terms, and we need to remember that. The second thing I think we need to remember is that was a time of acute crisis. Uh, HIV was seen at the time, and people who aren't old enough to remember it and struggle with this. Uh, it, was, it was really seen as being something that could lead to hundreds of thousands of deaths and was actually a threat to overall society. Therefore, everything was possible. At the time of crisis, all sorts of new ideas are able to be thought of and to be exploited, and that enabled Norman Fowler, I think, to actually push forward on that. And the final thing I'd like, like to reflect on in that, which is very much about pragmatism, is what enabled that to happen was Thatcher. Not because she wanted it to happen, she allowed it to happen, but it was the political air cover that she gave to a Tory government to enable that to happen. She was at the time literally standing side by side with Ronald Reagan in the war on drugs and was making statements in support of just say no. But that then meant that the political uh, opprobrium that would have been heaped on a left inclined government for setting up needle exchanges didn't happen. And it didn't happen because of Thatcher's impeccable socially conservative credentials. So the crisis, the fact that the evidence existed about what there was to do about it, the fact that it was other people who were at risk rather than drug users, 
and the fact that it was politically advantageous to do it at the time of the right-wing government, all of that enabled the, 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 the first seeds to be sown and, and us to begin to embark on, on the journey that's taken us to, to where we are now. The next scene, lots of other things happening. I'm just, just picking out emblematic things from each of these prime ministers. The crisis of 80. Uh, and people, instead of thinking, oh, oh God, you know, we're not all going to die from HIV, because uh, no one's ever grateful. Uh, the next thing that happens, people say, hang on a minute, we don't like this uh, methadone prescribing and needle exchanges because we're just, just encouraging people to use drugs, aren't we? And the government all of a sudden went, went very cold on it. And the health minister under, uh, under John Major, one of the health ministers under John Major, got called the Prime the Winnie, set up a, a review. He, he wanted basically to stop maintenance prescribing. Maintenance prescribing had come in as Maggie says, till the 80s, it was a short-term, it was a short-term script, officially labelled as detox. And one of the things that happened is people were on short-term detox scripts for longer and longer and longer and longer. And as long as you called it that, nobody asked too many questions. Uh, but once the crisis had abated, all of a sudden they started asking questions. Aren't we just prolonging people's drug use with this? So what then happened was a classic piece of white on. Classic piece of yes and yes. You could have, the civil servants, the medics, people like me who were on the periphery of it, could have said to Brown and Winnie, you're wrong, pal, here's 87 reasons why you're wrong, you can't do this. They didn't. They said, oh, absolutely. Let's set up a working party. Let's get all the experts on it. And then we'll produce a report for you about what we ought to do. He said, great idea. So, of course, they did, they did that. They packed the working party full of people who believed in maintenance prescribing. The working party reported, and the working party didn't have our job because all the evidence moved in that direction. But all of a sudden, when they reported, it was a fixed professional view, and the fixed professional view then saw off the political uncertainty. To, and the, the, the victory was so complete that towards the end of the major government, for the first time ever, uh, the Department of Health actually issued purchasing guidance to what were then health authorities for them to actually commission maintenance prescribing. Now that wasn't until April 1997. That's interesting, that, that, that might seem, to the younger people in this audience, that might seem a long, long time ago, but to some of us it's like a week last Tuesday. <laughs> April 1997. Less than 20 years. Um, but interestingly, one of the things that the, the, the critics of the current uh, drug policy system tend to do is they forget that it was the major government that did that. They assume it was Blair that did that. Uh, Blair did lots of things, but he didn't do that. Uh, but we moved to Blair. Another, another trade off. Uh, during the major years, the money didn't go up at all. Uh, Ken Clark had imposed uh, financial stringency on the economy. Those of us in the drug treatment sector who saw the money that had, that had poured in <coughs> on the back of HIV AIDS realised that there were, there were hundreds of thousands of people who needed treatment to be weren't getting it. Waiting times were, were averaging nine weeks and in many places they were, they, they were many months. Drug related deaths were going up even faster then than they are now. Uh, the, the, uh, drug related crime was, was a major problem uh, but no one was spending any more money on it. We tried and failed to use uh, Hep C as the new HIV, but that didn't work because it didn't quite have the God we're all going to die impact. Not least because the people who were mostly going to die were injected drug users. So what? Yeah, it's the, the great fear around HIV was that some drug user was going to have sex with your daughter and she was going to die. Yeah, that was putting it bluntly. That was, that was the concern, and you couldn't quite get that same, same degree of traction around, around Hepsen. But you could around Bairdon and Shotley. So the Blair government comes in, you, those of you around at the time remember the slogan, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. 50% of the increase in crime that was going on in the 90s 
was attributed by the Home Office to a positive crime committed by injecting publicans. The evidence was clear that investing in treatment would prevent at least half of that crime and it would also deliver other benefits. So basically, the Blair government offered the treatment sector a deal. We'll give you shed loads more money, you agree to prioritise offenders, and everyone's going to be much better off. A lot of the sector didn't want that deal at all, particularly the NHS. I didn't come, come into drug treatment to reduce crime. We, we should be spending these resources anyway. Uh, that was dealt with in two ways, effectively. The first was to take a lot of work off the NHS and give it to the third sector, uh, which is much more flexible and much more responsive. And the second, much more important reason, long term, was although initially, in order to keep faith in the government's priorities, offenders were fast-tracked into treatment, that actually only lasted for about 12 months. And what happened very quickly was the entire treatment system grew. So the waiting times came down uh, from the average of nine weeks to where they are now, which is five days. And that was for everybody, not just for the offenders. So that was the deal, that was the Fausti impact. You allow us to deliver our agenda, and the amount of money invested will go up from 250 million to 750 million. The type of treatment you deliver to offenders will be exactly the same as the treatment you deliver to everybody else. Their health benefits will flow, the benefits for their employability, their ability to look after their children, their risk of contracting BBV will all go down, as will everybody else's. And in the end, the sector as a whole settled for that deal. Fast forward to Gordon Brown, and this is the one that got away. Uh, while the money was still flowing, the emphasis was getting people into treatment, stopping them dying, uh, keeping them stable. There was much less emphasis on things like jobs, houses, long-term recovery. Uh, early in 2008, uh, after Gordon Brown became Prime Minister, did anyone remember British Jobs for British Workers? Yeah. Sounds like a Nigel Farage slogan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Gordon was interested in this and could have made it work. Interestingly enough, uh, the current government's attempts to get people into work are based very much on individual, the individual's needs and the individual benefiting from recovery and employment's role in entrenching that recovery. So that's morally perfect. It's going nowhere. And it will go nowhere in large measure because what's really driving it, although that's the top line, what's really driving it is cutting the benefits bill. And if you're DWP and you want to cut the benefits bill, there's far more people with mental health problems and bad backs than there are with drug or alcohol addiction to stop them going to work. So where do you put your energy, where do you put your effort not into that drug and alcohol users? You put it elsewhere in the system. However, what Gordon would have spun it as wouldn't be we need to provide routes out to recovery for drug users. Either spun it as no life on the dole. The rest of us are all working. Echoes of the George Osborne's, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting up at six o'clock in the morning, Britain and looking at the other people who still got their curtains closed. It would have been spun as stopping people having a life on them. The reality would have been having systems that were focused on getting people into work that would have delivered them an awful lot of benefits for their long-term health and welfare. But that wouldn't have been how it was for. Uh, in the end, the crash happened and it all, got, it all got forgotten. And what happened in the midst of that was, instead of there being a job circus, all of a sudden there were enough jobs to go around. And the last people, the public, would be happy to get jobs are the people who need drug and alcohol treatment. Because they, they, you know, because as far as they, they're concerned themselves and their sons and daughters who haven't, who, who haven't got the, uh, the problems associated with drug and alcohol addiction should have been given priority. So Cameron. Uh, the Cameron government came in with a commitment to abolish the National Treatment Agency uh, to introduce abstinence-based treatment rather than long-term maintenance uh, and to invest huge amounts of money 
in, in rehabs, and to make sure that where methadone was provided, it was provided on a short-term basis only. That was the agenda. Major threat to what had been built up from the 80s until 2010. Major threat that didn't materialise in the end. And it didn't materialise largely because the civil servants didn't work. We'll go back to yes, Minister. If you're working in the Department of Health, doesn't matter what incoming ministers say, as far as you're concerned, you don't like drug-related deaths, you don't like the spread of BBV. So if something has actually got to challenge and threaten that, you're, you're going to stop it happening. You're not going to say, oh, oh, minister, you're wrong. It doesn't work like that. Similarly, if you're in the Home Office and you believe that crime is being held back by people having immediate access to a methadone script, you're not going to actually kick people out of having a methadone script, script after six or eight weeks. So the civil servants were very keen that the government didn't actually implement the policy that it had identified <coughs> in opposition. So how do you stop them doing that? You play for time. You set up another working group. But one of the things that had to happen in order to do that was that the government had to be given something that made it look like they were going to get what they wanted. So the agreement that was struck across Whitehall was that we would, all, we would actually look at time-limited methadone. So the review that was promised actually looked at time-limited methadone. And that was the headline. And uh, lots of people wanted to have me from the nearest land post because the NTA was going to introduce time-limited methadone. Uh, they didn't read what it said. Fortunately, neither did Ian Duncan Smith. Because <laughs> uh, it was much more carefully phrased. Uh, but one of the things you can rely on usually in these issues is that the ministers and the special advisors don't understand the agenda. So over time, we actually, so the, the object of the exercise was to play it for long enough that they stopped looking at the world as an opposition and began looking at the world as a government. So once they've been in office six months, all of a sudden, the Home Secretary, instead of seeing methadone as something that just prolongs people's addiction and replaces one addiction with another, all of a sudden, she saw it as a major way of, of keeping crime low. And even in those days, she harboured the ambitions to be Prime Minister. Uh, she was having a lot, lot of trouble with the immigration target. She didn't want to have similar problems with the crime target. Andrew Lansley didn't want to be actually ceding control over his budgets, any part of his budgets, to Ian Duncan Smith when he actually came and demanded that it all be handed over to him as part of his social justice agenda. So the policy door was slammed shut by the Home Office, the money door was slammed shut, shut by DH. In the end, uh, the Strang report, Medications in Recovery, was published and a maze maze came out against time limited <coughs> method but did identify how methadone prescription could be used in a much more proactive way than it had been previously in order to encourage recovery. So again, if you just, the point of this really is if you stand up and tell them you're wrong, you'll get nowhere. If you actually roll with the punch and say, all right, what do you want? Here's how we give you what you want, and here's how we, we make sure that what you want is aligned with what the evidence tells us, and how we can continue to give benefit to people who you actually aren't very interested in. So, moving on, just from the less, less than our house, yeah, Le less than our house, yeah. Just, just where we are today, where we are today. The, the negatives, start off with the negatives first. The first is we're, 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 we're pay, paying the price of our success in many ways. Uh, um, the, the, the Prime Minister was uh, swapping uh, uh, lines from songs by the Smiths in Parliament the other day. I don't even know who they are. Uh, but but there's, a, there's a Bob Dylan line, uh, uh, there's no success like failure. And it sums up Whitehall. The last thing you want to do in Whitehall is succeed in anything. As soon as you do, it drops down the priority lines. And as soon as it drops down the priority, no money, no influence, no political time. The problem with drug treatment in this country is it's been too successful. HIV rates are too low. Uh, crime, a third of the, of the 
dramatic reduction in crime we've seen over the last decade or so, home office is scribe to treatment. Uh, and that has taken the political guts out of the issue. The same strength it gave to the issue when those issues hadn't been resolved has now drained away as those issues have been resolved. And we're now dependent on saying we have a very vulnerable, increasingly frail treatment population who are in their 50s and 60s, even after them in their 30s and 40s and in their 50s and 60s, physically, yeah? who are no longer able to shin up a drain pipe and yeah, steal stuff out of your house. And they need services. They need more services than they ever done. They, they ever did. And the answer largely is, and. That's, that's the problem. We've actually taken the threat away. And after last week, it's going to get worse. Because any energy there is, is going to be on constitutional matters, renegotiating with, uh, with, with Brussels, stopping Scotland, leaving. They're going, to be, they're going to be the issues. The sort of route we branch before that we need if we're going to tackle the underlying causes of addiction, which for me are rooted in inequality and poverty, we're not going to get there. We might get unhelpful short-term fixes, but we're not going to get the sort of changes that, that we need. On the positive side, uh, we've still got twice as much money being invested in the system than we had in 2001. Money was flat between 2008-13, it's gone down about 25% since, but it went up so much between 2001 and 2008 on the back of the crime agenda that we've still got twice as much money to spend as we had in 2001. So there is enough money in the kitty to do stuff. Do as much as we want to do? No. But there's still enough money in the kitty to do stuff. The second thing is we have held on to the evidence. By all this manoeuvring, we still have a situation where the, the, the 2010 drug strategy fitted the evidence. The modern crime prevention strategy that the Home Secretary launched in April, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read that, I know it sounds, you know, really hell want to read that, but the drug and alcohol stuff, particularly the drug stuff, is well worth reading, particularly if you want to get an insight into what's likely to be in the drug strategy, which was due to be published the same day, but wasn't. Yeah, and that makes it very clear that the Home Secretary's view, maybe our next Prime Minister's view, is that it's worth investing in drug treatment because it drives down crime. And that is still a belief. We have a workforce that has grown hugely, not only in size, but also in skill levels. Uh, and that's been very apparent to me coming back into the sector over the last 12 months, is the level of skill and commitment. Because the commitment's always been. The, the, the skill and sophistication, I think, is far greater than there ever used to be. Also, is the quality of management and leadership far better than it used to be. And then the final thing in relation to this is we have, some of this was alluded to earlier, yeah? we have, there were 450,000 heroin users. Uh, if we take the Home Office's estimates, and I know Matt, Matt doesn't buy any of this, but <laughs> In terms of estimates. But anyway, for, for the Home Office view, there were 450,000 heroin users at the height of the epidemic. Uh, and there's now about 250,000. And the home, again, the Home Office's view is that that isn't accidental. That every person who's in treatment is less likely to be recruiting new cohorts of users. They're less likely to be dealing, they're less likely to be bringing other people into those. Behaviors. So treatment of itself has played a very significant role in doing that. Crime, drug-related crime is going down, as I said before, 30% of the reduction in crime is, is attributable to uh, the, 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 the availability of treatment. Uh, around 2% of our injecting population uh, are HIV positive compared to about 5% in Germany, 20% in the US, 70% in parts of Russia. Uh, that legacy is still there. The big thing we've got to sort out is drug related deaths, and that's a major challenge for all of us to get on top of that. The, but the most important challenge, I think, is to find a new narrative. Uh, as government is preoccupied elsewhere, local authorities who already hold the budget will become more and more important. How do we identify a new narrative that chimes with them to make them want to invest? 
in this agenda and this population. How do we do that? How, how do we come up with a new narrative that will be as successful with local politicians and local officials as the HIV and crime narratives were with national politicians and national officials? And that's one of the things that, that a collective voice we're working on and we want to be working with the entire sector in identifying that narrative. Final, final thought. Uh, this isn't a quote, something I made up. Uh, if you want to actually, if you want to actually do stuff for people that no one else gives a toss about, you've either, you've either got to take power and control, control things. If you think you can do that, if you think you can actually take control of the system, fine. If you can't, you've got to ally yourself to the people who do control the system and find a way within their overall agenda of delivering your must-haves to the population you're trying to look after. If you do that, you'll make a contribution. <coughs> if you stand to one side criticising, you can write thousands of letters to the Guardian or send millions of tweets. It ain't going to do much. But if you actually work out who's got the power, how can I exploit what they want in order to deliver what I need to do to do the good I want to do, then you've got half a chance. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.